and then I start the webinar. Well, I'm not sure as if I've started recording. I think I start recording. And there. Good luck. And I start. Good afternoon. Welcome to Food Matters, Growing Relationships Through Indigenous Food Sovereignty. This is the second in a series of webinars that the Jesuit Forum is doing on food issues. So we're delighted to have you today. And we're particularly delighted to have our special guests, uh, Don Morrison, Clifford Paul, and Isaac Crosby, who will be, will be introducing in just a little bit in more detail. But uh, thank you so much for coming today. We're very grateful for you sharing your time and your wisdom with us. And uh, we're just really happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Mark Hathaway. I'm the Executive Director of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice. Uh, we're a really small organization. Uh, you'll see Victoria, Trevor, and I are, are the team at the, at the Jesuit Forum. And uh, we do work mainly around having small group conversations aimed at really working for a change of heart and mind and practices. Uh, in areas related to social justice, ecological sustainability, and uh, finding fulfilling ways of living well in harmony with each other as people, but also with the wider uh, earth community. And at the same time, you know, challenging structures of injustice and systemic oppression and trying to build right relationships. So uh, as I say, we're delighted to have you here today uh, before we go any further, uh, we'd like to just take a moment to begin in a good way, uh, acknowledging our responsibilities as treaty peoples and our gratitude for the land and the gifts of the creator. Uh, so I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Trevor Scott, to begin with the land acknowledgement. So welcome again, everyone, to this webinar focused on Indigenous uh, food sovereignty. And the gifts of the Creator. Upon our sustenance comes from the land itself that we walk upon. We begin our time together by recognizing so welcome again, everyone, to and acknowledging the territory. diverse traditional territories of the Indigenous and people upon which we gather this afternoon as one small means towards reconciliation and right relationships. For the Jesuit form itself, we acknowledge the land we meet upon, commonly known as Toronto, is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. They offered assistance to the early European travelers to this territory and share their knowledge for survival in what was at times a harsh climate. And we also acknowledge that Toronto area, only known is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And now I invite each of you just to silently acknowledge the land upon which you are on which you live, upon which we meet today. Today we meet on these lands, which are still the home of myriad living beings and the home of many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge all of them with gratitude and remember our sacred responsibilities as treaties peoples. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, just before we go any further today, I'll just uh, take some time to mention some technical aspects. Uh, for anyone new to using Zoom, there's a question and answer button down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, that if you kind of mouse over it, you'll see that. If you have any questions that you'd like to pose for our guests today, uh, that would be the place to put that. Um, there's also a chat function. 
Uh, and that can be used if you have, we'll be sharing links in the chat function. Uh, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, acknowledge lands as well that, that from which you're uh, listening to or participating in this webinar today, you can also put that there or greetings, uh, share greetings with other people. Uh, so we invite you to do that and that would be wonderful. Uh, but so the chat is more for that and for the links, whereas the Q&A will be more for asking questions. Uh, I want to just briefly talk about this series that we're doing before we get to the introduction of our guests. Uh, you know, food plays such a vital role in our lives. Uh, it's, it's an absolute human necessity, of course. We all need to eat uh, to survive and to thrive, but Food has so many other meanings than that. It, it's a really, so much of culture is wound up with food, so much celebration and human meaning and so much uh, of what it means to be human really. And the way we raise food and the way we, the way our relationship to food is really important too in terms of our relationship with the planet as a whole. Uh, we can see gift as a gift of creation or a gift of creator. Uh, but we can also, many have come to, to see food more and more as a commodity, something to be bought and sold, to be traded, to be profited. Uh, and we know that, that food is also very much wound up in questions of justice and injustice. Many people don't have enough food. Um, many as well, ecological devastation, you know, uh, climate change, uh, soil degradation, biodiversity loss, so many of these things are wound up with the way that uh, particularly industrial agriculture has come to, to try to produce food. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why at the Jesuit Forum we decided to do this, this series on food sovereignty, because food is something we can all connect with in a very visceral way. Um, Food sovereignty can be, really be defined as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sustainable practices and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. So it really goes beyond food security. It includes food security, but goes beyond that. And back in December, when we had the first webinar in this series, uh, we had Nettie Weave and Leslie Campbell and we discussed the seven pillars of food sovereignty at that time, uh, its relationship to social and ecological justice, and how food security, uh, what, that, what food sovereignty might actually look like in practice. Like if we were to imagine a, a true food, so what would food sovereignty in different contexts actually look like? And so today we're, we're kind of moving a, another step into this journey on, on exploring food sovereignty to look at indigenous food sovereignty in particular, and why it's so important to both recover and to reimagine traditional food systems, localized food systems, live in reciprocity with the more than human world and revalue indigenous cultures, knowledge and practices, and really learn from you know, the many years of practice of you know, the, the thousands and time immemorial of living on this land and finding ways to have food from this land, but living sustainably within ecosystems. Uh, so that's what we're hoping, it, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to have our guest today uh, to talk with us about this, but I'll let my colleague, uh, Victoria Blanco, will, will uh, introduce them in more detail. Hello, I'm Victoria, and I'm currently situated in what is today called Toronto, which is on the Dish With One Spoon territory. I'm so grateful and honored to be able to introduce our three speakers. Um, today, what will happen is that we will have Don Morrison um, be a speaker, but also a moderator. So we're very grateful for Don for having taken those two roles. And Don is a Shewekmeh ancestry and is the founder and curator of the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty. Um, we also have Isaac Crosby, who comes from unceded land about half an hour south of Windsor, a small farming community called Harrow, Ontario. He is proud of his Ojibwe Black Canadian heritage and looks forward to sharing their history. And last but not least, 
least, we have Clifford Paul, who hails from the Mi'kmaq district of Unamaki and grew up in the First Nation community of Member Two. Um, so I'm, I'm so excited to hear what each one of you um, has to say uh, and especially to listen and to learn and unlearn and see how we can uh, move forward uh, together. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll leave it to Don. Okay. Um, White Hokwada, I've just greeted you all in my Shikwatmuk language and I said hello everyone. And I'm really grateful to be here today and be invited to, to share in this sacred conversation with my brothers to the East, um, Isaac and Clifford. I'm really super excited to learn about your work and to share about our work and figure out um, how that's connected. I'm sure it is. Um, and there's a beautiful big field of um, Indigenous food related knowledge that's been mobilized across Canada and, and around the world really. And so I'm um, really grateful to be part of it. And, and um, I was asked to do a little opening prayer, which I'll just maybe more humbly say is about a setting intention and giving thanks. Um, and I say Cook's Jam to Kel Kukpi, to our creator. Thank you for this beautiful day, the beautiful sunshine, the beautiful land, the water, the forest, the fields, the plants, the animals, the people that provide us with our food and all of the rich um, teachings of what it means to be more fully realized in in good relationship to our food. And we ask that in our work, we bring ourselves in our best, the best representation of ourselves to, um, to learn how to be better human beings and have food teach us that. Uh, we know that um, Creator has given us a special gift to be able to transform our food into us. And it's probably the most powerful thing we do every day and we've, we take it for granted often. So, so Kukstam, thank you. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to be in, this, in that work here together um, to learn from the ancient, ancient uh, wisdom and knowledge and protocols of indigenous people and um, and uh, specifically Clifford and Isaac from your Anishinaabek and your um, Mi'kmaq uh, ancestry. And um, yeah, I think we um, were grateful for the original instructions that were given to us as Indigenous peoples by Creator um, to live in, in the good way. So, so. I would like to now um, start with, um, maybe shall we start with you, Isaac? And I can present the questions and then um, we can go through to Clifford and I will, I'll reserve my speaking until the end. And um, I suspect that I'll, um, what you guys will bring is, is gonna be full of richness and, um, and uh, the scale that I work at is kind of more um, translocally. So um, I think it's better you go first. So I'm not uh, repeating um, a lot of what I think will be said at the local level that you each work, work in. So, so the questions that have been uh, put forward for, for each of us to speak about. Uh, number one, tell us about yourself and what has inspired or guided your work around Indigenous food sovereignty and justice? Uh, what values underpin uh, in Indigenous food sovereignty and how are those expressed both within and beyond Indigenous communities? And uh, what might Indigenous food sovereignty look like in your own community? And how does it help to achieve social justice? Um, and recovering traditional and local knowledge. 
and how that's linked to ecological regeneration. I know this is this is all the questions at once, so I'm happy to go back to it um, if needed. Um, but uh, the last question that's listed here for us is how can indigenous food systems and sovereignty contribute to transforming indigenous food systems, or no, transforming food systems more broadly? And how can others work as allies to help achieve food sovereignty at a personal, local and wider level? So those are the four questions, but maybe if we each three of us speak to the first one first, and then we'll we'll go back so we don't have to try and respond to all the questions at once. Does yep. that make sense? Makes sense to me. Okay, great. And I'll just guide us back to those questions um, if we um, if we need to be reminded of them. So take it away, Isaac. All right. So, Anine, everybody. My name is Isaac Crosby. I come from the Ojibwa of, of the Andrewden from southwestern Ontario, so about as far south as you can go in Canada, that's where I'm from, that's where my people are from. We were the ones that, that took in and cared for the runaway slaves when they came to Canada way back when. Mixed, married, and mingled, produced people that look like me, lighter skin, darker skin, darker hair, lighter hair. So we call ourselves a darker hue of the native nation. Um, we are farmers, we still farm to this day. Uh, we, we, we had a reserve taken away from us. We were, we were disbanded from our land and traveled around and finally, after a while, they settled, they settled us in a swamp. And the swamp area, because we're because that is our area, we're farmers, we took that swamp area and made it to this beautiful agricultural land, which they are trying to take away from us again. <laughs> so now our fight is on. Our fight is to make sure that our future generations are, are secure in their food and their land coming forward. How I got involved in the whole indigenous food sovereignty, this whole movement, I've been doing this all my life. I grew up on a farm. Like I said, I never, I never grew up on a reserve. So there are certain teachings that we did not have, but we had the farm, we had farming. And that was our teachings that we got from our grandparents and so forth. So growing up, I always had to farm the countryside to look back on to fall back on whatever we lived in the city. Then when I moved to Toronto and started getting more involved in urban agriculture, I realized that there was a missing link within the indigenous community. I seen everybody else doing urban agriculture, everyone else doing all this great gardening and farming, but our community. And so after a while, I started meeting more people in the community that were doing, doing urban agriculture, but we were so separated from each other that we're finally starting to get, get together and work on our own strategic plan for the, for the city of Toronto. Um, I realized that living in the city of Toronto that more and more native youth were not connected to the land. They did not know how to, to grow their own traditional foods. And a lot of them didn't even know what their, what their traditional foods were. So that sparked the interest in me to teach and share what I know, what I've learned from my grandfathers, my grandmothers. And doing that has, has introduced me to a lot of youth who have this thirst for this knowledge, but just don't know where to go. So like I said earlier, a group of us are getting together and we're gonna present this knowledge to all the youth because we need, we need the youth to carry this forward because if the youth do not carry forward our traditional foods our our food sovereignty then it ends here we can't have that we can't have that we, we went through hundreds of years of almost being ended we we can't end now we did not come this far to die we've come this far to keep going and to teach other people the ways of gardening of, of gardening here and how to take care of this land when you're here in this country called canada um, I hope I answered that question right for you. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that I think gives a really good picture of how your work, um, who you are and um, how your work is inspired by Indigenous food sovereignty and social justice. So thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, Clifford? That, um, so the question again is around, um, just tell us about yourself, who you are and how your work is inspired and guided by uh, Indigenous food sovereignty and justice. Yes, uh, my name is Clifford Paul. I come from the Mi'kmaq district of Unamagi. And if you look at our traditional district map, there are seven districts of our territory. It covers a large territory. And Unamagi is represented by a place called Cape Breton. But Unamagi does not translate to Cape Breton. Unamagi translates to the land of the everlasting fog. <laughs> so if you're an East Coaster, 
you, you kind of, or a maritimer, you kind of understand what, why that Mi'kmaq name came to be because uh, that is the beauty of our, of our territory. And, um, you know, I come from the First Nation community of member two. And um, I've learned through my brother and through stories, my role as a, as a boy growing up and to be a man and developing these skills, which I later would learn would be food warrior skills, you know, to hunt, to fish, to gather, pick berries and all that. I did not know that that would be part of my education, part of uh, what I'd be doing today as a moose management coordinator, as a practitioner of the 2 ic and model, where I 2 ic and is the blending of my traditional upbringing, my traditional knowledge, and blending that with my modern Western scientific knowledge, using both. And for me, it's all about the stories. Uh, food sovereignty represents you know, when somebody told me food security, I didn't quite understand it. You know, maybe a decade ago when they told me what food security was all about and asked me to speak of it. But later, indigenous food sovereignty rep better represented uh, that meaning. And for me, it, uh, it was more completely understood when it was defined through indigenous food sovereignty. And, um, it's for me it's all about the stories so i can go tell a story of when i was a little boy three year old going in the woods with my mom and a group of women and i was the only kid of course i found an ant hill i flipped over a rock and next thing you know i was covered with ants the, the old lady who was in charge of these women the grouchy old lady. Well, she seemed to me back then because she was the one who told my mom in, in the Mi'kmaq language, see what happens when you bring your kids out. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's what it's all about. You have to bring the kids out to tell the stories. So our kids who, who learn and our grandkids, I have 11 grandkids, by the way, they all love traditional home cooked meals. Don't get me wrong. They'll still eat the crap dinner and the hot dogs, but but they really appreciate traditional home cooked meals. And my 10 year old who's learning the most, a 10 year old grandson who is a champion archer and a really good uh, food provider. He says, Papa, you know, he's telling me this on the coast while we're casting for uh, striped bass. Papa, he says, the only thing, the only, this is the only thing that makes me feel human. If you want to define a human experience, it's not webinars, it's not the TV, and it's not electronics. It is the continuation uh, and passing on to traditional knowledge. So for me, it's work, but I don't see it at work. I see it as my responsibility. And if the stories continue, our children, our grandchildren will say, oh, my Gaju, which is their matriarch, my Gaju takes me here and we pick gooseberries. We jump on a canoe, we go to an island and we pick gooseberries. My grandkids will say, yeah, we go here and we get eels, we go another place, we get striped bass, we go up in the mountains and we get moose. They're telling the stories, which includes their involvement. I don't want it and nobody wants it that they only see this in a book and that they only reference it where they would say, oh, my grandmother used to go to this island and pick gooseberries. We want it that our children will say, I've been there with my mother and my grandmother and we picked berries and we made this sauce. Once the stories end, you kill the spiritual connection. It stops and it's only referenced and it has to be lived. So indigenous food sovereignty has a big wealth and breadth of expression. And I can't wait to get into the other questions. I hope I answered your first question. I am speaking from the heart. So yeah. I do have notes. I will refer to notes, yes, but I enjoy speaking from the heart. I love what you said. I think it's probably the most 
uh, important uh, principle that I've heard every Indigenous community I've ever visited that has been first and foremost. It's the stories, it's upholding our sacred responsibility. Um, it's living the reality. It's not just a concept. It's an actual, you know, the term food sovereignty we know has um, only relatively recently been introduced into our vocabulary. Um, prior, like for thousands of years, our people have lived the reality of food sovereignty, but it's expressed within our own languages, our own cultures, our own um, stories and our own places. Um, when we think of the huge diversity of Indigenous peoples across uh, what's known to the settlers um, as the nation state of Canada, um, there's actually 98 nations and hundreds of communities. Um, I think it's like over 600 bands or communities. Um, that's a huge amount of diversity. So it's place-based and it's those stories that those uh, responsibilities, those relationships um, is in that context. So I think it's super important, um, the spiritual, what you've highlighted, what I've heard was that that responsibility and to live it, to be it, to be Indigenous. And um, I'm really grateful for that a way that you contextualized it. Um, as the founder and curator of the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty, um, we're coming up to our 16th birthday in March. Um, so it's been 16 years that I've been showing up consistently to organize time and space and mobilize knowledge and networks and learn from literally thousands of Indigenous peoples. Um, and so I, as a Shikwetmuk woman, I, um, like many of our people, I was, um, I, I experienced intergenerational impacts of Indian residential school and my family, um, on my mom's side, who I've inherited my Shikwetmukh ancestry, had been displaced from our land because of residential school and had also been um, used as labor, uh, exploited for labor in the orchard industry in um, the Okanagan Valley after they got out of residential school. And some of our elders would speak about, you know, the times when the early Chinese migrant workers came and um, and in residential school, how the kids were forced to work in the orchards and and were kind of not able to eat the traditional foods and lots of those stories um, kind of resonated deeply with me. And I also remember my mother telling me that. When I was born in 1961, um, around the time that they were scooping up Indigenous children um, and still taking them into care, um, they tried to take me. And the reason was, is they said, my mom didn't have enough food to feed me. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, that spiritually is what motivates me. I think my spirit has known um, that food is a very powerful framework to be able to heal to tell our own stories and to assert sovereignty, which I really think equates to Clifford, what you said about responsibility. Um, it's an inherent right, but more importantly, it's our responsibility to participate in a day-to-day -day basis on some indigenous food related action, whether that's hunting, fishing, gathering, picking berries, medicines, preparing it, teaching our children about it, um, land protection, like it can include there, and we know there's, you know, direct, direct action. Sometimes we need to take to protect certain sacred areas and harvesting sites from some of the harmful developments. Um, I know my, my, the women back home in my home territory are real warriors and, and the men, the hunters are out there um, wanting to, watch over and protect like moose and elk and wild salmon habitat. And so it's really that responsibility, um, I think is what kind of inspires me. And that is really uh, most recently, um, 
it's we've been involved our working group has been looking at coining a new term called indigenous food lands and try to broaden the scope and scale of food land conversation beyond an agriculture centric narrative to include the broader ecological, cultural and temporal scope and scale of indigenous hunting and gathering, um, which is persisted over 20 or 90% of the time humans have been on the planet, hunters and gatherers have persisted. And that's pretty significant in terms of the sophisticated knowledge in that. And so we, we play a keystone role in through our harvesting in enhancing biodiversity. So our harvesting strategies and techniques yeah. are producing methods. So that living the reality of it is a form of conservation and that's our responsibility too. So, so that's kind of what inspires my work. And, um, and that brings us to the second question. Uh, so we'll go back to Ian. And again, um, it's the second question is what values underpin Indigenous food sovereignty and how are these expressed both within and beyond Indigenous communities? Okay. So let's look at the values. So when I think of the values for, when I think of the values for Indigenous food sovereignty, I'm thinking of sharing, giving, and trading that are strong values within First Nations communities, within our communities. Because um, if you think about it, we give. I know within my community, giving, giving these three things are our prime examples of who we are. Giving to those who, for now, who don't have as much as you have. Then we have, you know, you share, you share, you share what you grow, you share what you make, you share what you, you share what you, you, you eat. Sometimes you share, you'll share your shoes, you share your socks, right? But it's about sharing. And then trading, well, you know, we trade with each other, we trade with other communities, we trade with other families. If I'm, if my family has, we have a bunch of green beans, if someone has a bunch of, bunch of potatoes, we'll trade for potatoes for green beans, right? It's about keeping, keeping these three values open within, within all of us. Because especially when it comes to food and food sovereignty, this is where we can really help each other out by giving the time, by giving the knowledge to, to communities, to, to the youth especially, and even to the elders who haven't, maybe haven't grown up in that, giving time, giving, giving the knowledge about the seed, about the food about to, about to grow, the traditional time, the traditional knowledge, and sharing the seeds with each other, sharing, sharing the plants, the seedlings, sharing the knowledge as well, maybe sharing your time going to other communities and helping out with the, with the, with the gardening, with the breaking of the earth, with the ceremonies. Sharing and sharing, sharing the stories as well, because all of our plants, all of our food, they all have stories with them. They come with them. They come with the seeds. They come with the growing, with the growing times. And when you're sharing, we're sharing all that. You're also sharing the fact that our food is our medicine as well. So you're sharing a lot. And when it comes to trading, like you said, you're trading. You're trading what you've grown. You're trading maybe what you've made. And you're trading, trading amongst other people. And a big thing for us, especially now that we have. We have the world in Canada. We have to take these three things and share and do amongst other people. Because it'd be great to share to share with someone from a different country about certain foods are growing. So I can teach them about the food we grow here. So I can show them and teach them about the traditional way of growing food here and how we took care of the food, how we took care of the land, right? Because as you said, like Clifford said, this is our responsibility. This is not our job, it's our responsibility. So giving, sharing and, and trading are the three values to underpine indigenous food sovereignty for me. And it goes, like I said, it does go beyond the indigenous communities. We have to include everybody within this mix, within our giving, sharing, and trading, because we no longer live in separate places. We all live together. We're all sharing, sharing space. We're all sharing time if we're working together. So to be able to do all these things and keep, keep these three things open, we can create a better environment and a better world for the future generations. So for me, the underpinning, the underpinning values or underpinned values are giving, sharing, and trading. Awesome, beautiful, beautiful. Yes, the, that's, that, that's a beautiful way of describing our, our, um, our economy, economic values. It's a giving, sharing, trading economy at all. And it's, 
beautiful that it's still alive. Those values are still here. They haven't lost them. Beautiful. Thank you, Isaac. Um, Clifford, would you like to um, talk about what values underpin Indigenous food sovereignty and how they're expressed both within and beyond Indigenous communities? Yeah, I think um, it all comes down to, again, our spirituality and that connection. Um, you know, around here, the buzzword is maybe across Canada too, is land-based teachings. And I sit in uh, confusion because yes, I live on the East Coast and I have a landscape and I have a seascape and I gather my food uh, on the land, on the sea and everywhere in between those two places. So um, for me, it is those land-based teachings and it's based on uh, the, the values of uh, my sense of place, my sense of awareness as a Mi'kmaq person, as an indigenous person who, who survives off the land. And you know, that if you wanna kill that spiritual connection, you kill, you take away that connection to that, to that landscape or the seascape. And that has happened to the Mi'kmaq people. The Mi'kmaq, a strong and vibrant nation with a very strong warrior history. Through disease and colonization, we lost a, a foothold of that. Yet we have treaties that, uh, you know, this is unceded Mi'kmaq territory. The Mi'kmaq have not lost a war to any nation, especially the British crown and all other foreign nations that have tried to uh, impose their will in our in our territory, but there was a time in our history when there was diseases and we lost that stranglehold, and we lost access to the food. It was illegal for us to hunt and fish, and you kill that connection. And when it came to, I know I'm going into other questions, but this is how, how it all interacts to answer this question. We had uh, Supreme Court decisions in our favor, which reminded Canada and the problems of Nova Scotia that Mi'kmaq treaties are valid, existing, and still in force. And the heart of those treaties is our connection to Mother Earth, the land, and the water, and our food acquisition. I remember I was a journalist in the 80s. I've been around quite a bit there. To Don, I was born in 1963. Okay. And I was a journalist in the 80s, and I remember we were going to court over our treaty right to hunt moose. Imagine it was illegal for me, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, or anybody in the last 110 years, it was illegal for us to hunt moose. So where did all the knowledge go? So we won the court, our community organized the hunt, and we went out to harvest moose. And a couple of them were shot. And we just stood there and we looked at each other. What do we do next? There were two men in our community who grew up in Ontario. They were Mi'kmaq, but their father was from Ontario. And they remember hunting moose in Ontario with, with their fathers and grandfathers. And they brought, they brought the knowledge back into our communities. So you want to kill the uh, spirit, you kill that connection. And the government and colonization has done that. But it all comes down from the Mi'kmaq saying. And you hear this at uh, the end of a prayer, all my relations. You'll hear everybody from east to west, all my relations. And in Mi'kmaq, it's, it's expressed as emsit nogama, all my relations. So at the end of a prayer, when I say all my relations, it does not necessarily, but it does include my my immediate family, my cousins, my future generations, my past generations. It includes them, but also Emsit Nogama also means the land, the water sustain me. All the particles that made up this land, 
that makes the blade of grass, that makes the insects, that makes the fish, that makes the waterways, the trees, all those materials sustain me. And I am part of that. That is my sense of place, my connection. So when I die, the circle of life, everything that made me uh, is passed on through nutrients to help all these other organisms live. And when I say at the end of a prayer, all my relations, I am also talking about the blades of grass, the soils, the fish, the birds, the mammals and insects, because we're all made up of this particles of our ecosystem that makes the moose my brother, the goose my sister, the blade of grass, my uncle, the soils and the insects, my cousins, we're all related. So when you look at that, you have to understand that all these teachings are expressed in stories, which are great and we're, uh, go into our long-term knowledge when they're told and passed on by a voice more ancient than mine, sitting at the edge of a lake with a fire going, and you got the songs, the smells, the sounds of nature, and the knowledge is passed on. Mm -hmm. You know, I am bound by um, a concept called nedigal limb. And I can't say bound. I am guided by that. And nedigal limb, it, I will have to read, though, for that one. That's a definition. And nedigal limb, it governs my behavior when I'm in the natural world, when I'm acquiring food, when I'm fishing, gathering berries, or learning about medicines. Nedigal limb, it, 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 it's my guide and principle. A Nedogolimp is a Mi'kmaq concept. It is the use, well, the name Nedogolimp is Mi'kmaq, but the concept is global. So Nedogolimp is the use of the natural bounty provided by the creator for the support, self-support and well-being of the individual and the community. Nedogolimp is achieving adequate standards of community nutrition and economic well-being and there should be a comma, and it should have this in there too, and uh, achieving adequate standards of traditional knowledge, because that's ever conducive to our survival. It should be in that definition. And to do so without jeopardizing the integrity, diversity, or productivity of our environment. It's all encompassed in that one word, or that one word that explains the concept of nedigalin. So if I am following Nedigalim, I am harvesting, harvesting knowledge, I am sharing, I am teaching, I am under the impression and the understanding that I am part of this ecosystem as a human. I am not stronger than anything within this ecosystem. I have a role in this ecosystem and I have responsibility. Um, I remember uh, one of my elders say, telling me, my guiding elders telling me, you know, Clifford, we fought hard for our treaty rights. We fought hard to show Canada that our treaties are valid, existent, and still in force. And you can use that treaty right, and you can hunt to feed your families. You can do this. You can approach it as an individual. But also, it's more important if you look at it from a community standard from the community. Not everybody is gifted enough to hunt and fish and get around the territory. So it's your responsibility. The key word, he says, with these rights come great responsibility. And our people today who have fought so hard for these treaty rights, I know I'm getting into social justice, but I'm getting to the point of uh, what these responsibilities are. So for me, as a indigenous person on the East Coast who, has, who, who proved to Canada that our treaty rights are valid, existing and still in force. It's my role to help and it's the role of other teachers and other families to come together and share that knowledge, embrace that knowledge, protect the knowledge and the best protection of that knowledge. You ask any, you ask any academic, how do we best preserve and protect traditional knowledge? And they will tell you, oh, you have, we have rules and laws and protocols. 
for intellectual property rights and there's things we can do that way. And then you ask a fella, and then a man or a woman who, who, who are indigenous food sovereignists, what is the best way to protect our traditional knowledge? And they will tell you the best way to, to protect our traditional knowledge is to impart that knowledge on our youth and our children and our grandchildren and so on and so on and so on. So that the stories, the, the, they're not unbroken, that they're passed down. And uh, it took me a while to figure it out because I was listening to stories as a kid, doing these things. And uh, it took me a while to figure it out. Oh, they're passing on this knowledge, this important knowledge, which is ever conducive to my survival or my survival. And that it now that I am their age and beyond, it is my job for as long as I could to impart that knowledge on our youth. They're yeah. the ones who are going to notice trends in nature, trends, highs and lows, peaks and valleys in in populations and in in. Uh, they can see droughts, they can see all these different things. So we have to make sure that our children and future generations are privy, privy and witnesses to what's going on in the natural world. So that to me, that is the core values, foundations of indigenous food sovereignty and yes. the recognition of our rights and our responsibilities. That's amazing. I really appreciate um, that you took the time to, to, to really answer that um, question in the high context that you have, because I realize we've got four questions, but really they're all interconnected. And I think the most powerful indigenous minds think that way automatically. Um, you can't separate one question from the other actually, because we our our worldviews, our understanding of the world is all connected. And when we come to values around spiritual, spiritual uh, connections to nature, you know, when we eat the food, it becomes us. The food yes. comes from the land. So we are part of the land. We can't actually separate that and and the harmful um, the, the disconnection from our land that's happened, uh, that's been imposed through colonization is real. And, and we do need to really look at taking the responsibility to go back to that land and make a conscious effort to do that. And I think it's really, really super important. You can't overstate that. And so I really appreciate um, that you shared that. And, and, um, when we think about, um, you know, our connection, as you said, to the ancestors and the people before us and the people to come, um, keep living the reality of food sovereignty is really the food sovereignty. It, it's following our original instructions to be, to, to just be. I mean, it can get food sovereignty and food security are very, can be very academic and technical terms. And we use them to engage with the nation state of Canada because we're, we're, we're kind of scrambling under duress to find ways to educate and engage um, to find social justice. Um, so we use these terms, but I think the way you've described it, Clifford, and the way you know we've heard literally thousands of elders and traditional knowledge holders speak to this, the same concept you're talking about. And, and in, in my language, um, when I think of values, um, I think of a word, um, and it means water gives life. It doesn't, it doesn't translate to water is life. It says water gives life. It's the action of the water to give life. It's what connects us to life. Um, and it's water that teaches us um, how to regenerate. So because water is the only substance on the planet that exists in three states, both solid, liquid, and gas, it it regenerates. It, it'll, you know, it'll it'll be ice and then it'll melt and then it becomes liquid, then it evaporates and it regenerates into water in the air. And 
it gives life in all three phases. And, and so the val it teaches also about the value of regeneration and um, holistic health. Um, so when we think of health, it's not just the health of our economy, it's the health of our spirit. It's the health of our, our physical body. It's the health of our emotions. Like how are we sensing and attuning to, to our world and to one another. And so uh, regeneration, I think is a really important value as well. Um, in our, in our, my home territory, uh, wild salmon is uh, the most important indigenous food and it's being, um, it's declining um, from once what used to be millions to now literally hundreds in some streams and tributaries. But we look to salmon to teach us um, as a metaphor what the values of regeneration is because through their life and death and going through that process, we learn a lot because they're their keystone species, like they, they've got the wisdom. Um, when we eat salmon, we eat the wisdom that they, that they embody through their relationship to water and to, um, in all its forms, but um, to place as well. So, so the, um, the values of uh, regeneration and holistic health, um, I think how that connects us to social justice and recovering and ecological regeneration. Again, we look to the plants and the animals to teach us um, how to, to regenerate ecosystems ourselves as a part of that. So part of that regeneration um, is about healing ourselves so that we can, can be responsible. I think colonization has brought has impacted our health in really serious ways. And I think we see a lot of, all, a lot of the poor mental health, um, the high rates of uh, addiction, diabetes, other food related illnesses and cardiovascular diseases is an indication that, um, you know, our connection to nature and its capacity to give life and to, to heal and regenerate um, we've, we've been disconnected from that. So we need to reconnect. We need to have the teachings and the tools. We need to make it a daily practice um, to be out on the land, to be, to be eating healthier and to become, to heal the emotions, the pain, the trauma of that and build, you know, within a kind of, even a, I'd, I'd use the word genocide informed uh, approach to healing the boat, the spirits um, that have uh, disconnected us. So those those are just some of the the values. I think when we think of social justice, um, it's thinking about things like racism and looking at the system and how it favors um, white people. Um, it favors a certain narrative because it's not. Uh, not just about the color of our skin. We know we have a lot of um, white settler friends and allies who, who are, are showing up to, to help us um, abolish some of the most harmful um, policies and laws that have been imposed. But it's also about kind of class analysis. It's about um, narrative, you know, so it's changing the narrative. It's changing, um, telling a different story and realizing ourselves all human beings as more than just producers or resources to be exploited to an external means, because that narrative is reached the limits of its growth within capitalism and production oriented thinking, which is really an, an industrial mindset. So it's in part telling ourselves a different story, looking to our language and our culture to say, well, how would we describe the action of garden beyond being a producer? because there's other ways, higher context um, terminology to be able to describe what we do when we grow or harvest food. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. And, um, uh, but I just wanted to, I think I kind of covered 
the second and third questions with that. But um, Ian, did you want to add anything more to, um, I know you, you spoke to the second question. Um, and the third question is uh, going to, again, what might Indigenous food sovereignty look like in your own community? And how does it help achieve social justice, recover traditional local knowledge and move us toward ecological restoration? Okay. Well, at Evergreen Brickworks, I am part of the group, we call it, we call it our INAC group. So we end up getting funding from Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada to help indigenize Brickworks for three years. So what we ended up doing was creating a program called Food, Medicine and Ceremony. And this ties in with Indigenous food sovereignty. So what it was was that we were teaching, well, really me, teaching Indigenous youth across the city about food, medicine and ceremony we took care of with, with Council Fire. So what that was doing was that was igniting the fire within these youth to take this knowledge back to their, to their, their homes, to wherever they're from, and to, to partake in it, to do something about it. So the youth will come back every single year and learn, learn about the food, go through all the food, and we'll learn about how we take our food and make it turn into medicine, even though it's, it's filling our, our bellies and also take care of our bodies as well. So that was our first three years. So our next version of it is creating these indigenous food hubs around the city. So one's gonna be at Brickworks. If you look at the picture behind me, you see where I'm pointing to the corn. This is part of one of the indigenous gardens at Evergreen Brickworks. That garden bed right there, when I first started four and a half years ago, there was barely anything in it. It was, it was left with nothing, nothing but refuse. And they asked me if I could take care of it. I said, yes, as long as I can do an indigenous, indigenous garden, then I can do this properly. And we ended up getting some funding and a funder came in and gave us a bunch of money to build even more onto it. So we built that, we built that in our first, first few years of food medicine ceremony. And then for our next one, as I said, we're looking at doing hubs within the, within the city of Toronto. So five hubs. So those will be the cardinal direction of North, East, Southwest, and one in the middle where Brickworks is. And each one of these pieces of, these hubs have pieces of land where in the indigenous community can actually come to and garden for free and grow food to supplement the food shortcomings within their households. So that is our second part of it. So doing all of that, looking at indigenous food ceremony, this is what it looks like, looks like in my community and how, how it goes back to teaching, teaching about traditional, traditional knowledge and local traditional knowledge. Because not every all the not all indigenous, indigenous people actually come from Toronto. Everyone, a lot of people come from elsewhere. So it's great to have everyone have their knowledge input in it as well. And when it comes to moves us towards our ecological restoration, just looking at the First Nations way of, of growing food, from my from my family, we everything we do is about taking care of the earth. It's our responsibility to take care of this earth. If you, if we are to scar the earth, then we must make sure we put something back and take care of her. Because if we do not take care of her, she will not take care of us. So we already know that within our farmlands across North America, that we, are, we have lost a lot of our trace minerals that used to create healthy food because of all the chemicals we have used. So now everyone's looking at indigenous, indigenous agricultural techniques to replenish and restore the ground that it's on. I mean, take a look at through the Three Sisters planting. If you do the the traditional three sisters or the trendy one, I, we always call it the, the corn, beans, and squash. You have to know that the, the, the beans are adding nitrogen back to the soil. So everything is helping each other out. So we have to take care of the, we have to take care of our, our ecosystem. And that's what our responsibility is as First Nations people, especially those of us who are, who are the farmers and gardeners of the area. We must take care of this, take care of this world, take care of this earth. So whenever I'm teaching the youth, I show them all the aspects of taking care of the earth. I also show them how to do one thing about taking care of the water and knowing where your water is coming from by introducing them to clay pot irrigation, which is something First Nations people have done for thousands of years. In Africa, they call it oil, which is using clay pots to keep the soil, keep the soil nice and moist, nice and damp for the plants to grow properly. I also, part of, the, part of that, I worked last year with a group called NDG, which was seven indigenous youth who were learning about landscape architecture architecture. So when they came down to Brickworks, I was teaching them about indigenous agricultural techniques, the traditional uses of the foods that we were growing, and why and how we do it throughout the seasons. So for me, with question number three, that is how, by doing all that, by being involved in the INAC, being doing the food and medicine and ceremony, 
and getting the second portion of it started is how I see indigenous food sovereignty working in this community that I'm in. Because as we all have said, we have got to get the youth involved. I mean, get the youth involved. I mean, I, can, I will go so far as saying getting some of our elders involved as well, because we need that intergenerational teaching and knowledge base to happen. We need our youth to step forward. I mean, our youth are already stepping forward, I should say, and they're, they're basically demanding this information, demanding this knowledge, but they don't know where to go. So those of us who have this knowledge, we must step forward. We must step up and say, hey, I will take you under my wing. I can show you this, that, whatever. And hopefully, hopefully you will pass this on to your children, to your friends and family as well. So as I said, all the stuff I'm doing that has to do with working with these youth in the Food Medicine Ceremony, NDG, is working towards doing a greater food, food sovereignty for indigenous folks within the city of Toronto because we have, we have a great need here. I know it's across the country, but here in Toronto, we have a need for it. We have some indigenous, food, indigenous families that are going without the food. So if I can get a way for them to grow food for next year, perfect. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow, well, that's, that is really important because I'm aware <laughs> that probably uh, 50 to 60% of indigenous peoples have migrated to urban areas because of a lack of affordable housing and employment opportunities and, and um, just, you know, to escape kind of the fourth world realities that we live on on reserves. So um, urban uh, food sovereignty is really important for Indigenous peoples, for everybody, but I think especially for Indigenous peoples who are overrepresented in some of the stricken neighborhoods in the cities. It is. It is. And what I also like, I, I do my best to take some of our traditional foods and do a modern twist with it. So what I did last year, before the whole onset of COVID, which kind of screwed things up, was that I was showing, I was showing our people how to grow wild rice in a container. Because my whole train of thought is that our water is being poisoned every single day, and we must take care of our water. We must know where our food comes from. If our wild rice is being produced in this poisoned water, that means that we are ingesting poisoned food. So I know some people were upset. Some people were sort of upset with me for doing it in a container. So we, we have to, we have to take control of our own food source. Because if we don't do it other people will. So yes. we have to think ahead. We have to think far ahead of how to protect our wild rice. Like this year, I'm doing ground nuts. I'm just introducing a lot of our youth to food they never ate before or even thought about growing. And that's really key to me because if we don't do that, we're losing, we will lose a lot of information, a lot of food sources for our, for our people. Yes, yes. Well, and I think um, maybe we can just ask you to speak to the final question. I think you're kind of almost entering into that um, to that question, um, which is how can Indigenous food systems and sovereignty contribute to transforming food systems more broadly? And how can others work as allies to help us achieve food sovereignty at both personal, local and wider levels? I know that that's a big question at all those levels. <laughs> Whatever you, you would like to speak on and then we'll move on to Clifford. Um, but I think that what you're saying about, to me in my mind, around the water mm -hmm. and helping people to realize the critical, uh, to me in my mind, it's the critical state of urgency. I realize that water has now been put on the stock market. Mm -hmm. And so now it, it's commodified and that's kind of scary, um, not just scary. for us, but for all people. So if you can speak a little bit more about how it serves to benefit all of people Really okay. and how we need people to support us in that. Okay, so me, want me to speak on it? Continue on with the question? Yes. Okay, yes. so <sighs> Indigenous food sovereignty has the ability to change a lot of our food ideas, our food growing ideas, because we have been stuck for the past, for hundreds of years, I'm going to say 150 years, I'm going to say hundreds, of working with the industrial way of growing our food. So we got away from away from all the traditional ways of taking care of the earth and decided to start using these man-made chemicals, which are doing nothing but bleaching the earth of all her all her trace minerals that our bodies actually need. So look, paying attention to the food systems that indigenous people have been doing can help us out a lot. Because our, our ways of growing things are our ways of rejuvenating the earth putting back what we take out of the earth. 
And we have to do that. Because if our soil is bad, that means our food is bad. If our food is bad, that means that our bodies are going to be bad and we're more susceptible to disease. So when it comes to, to looking at our food systems, I tell non-Indigenous people to, to, to reach out to other communities and be respectful. Don't just go there just for, for knowledge to run away. Follow traditional protocols. If, if tobacco is offered first, then you, you offer tobacco first. And you ask. And don't, don't expect them to say yes right away. Some don't. Because we need to, see what, need to see that you're real. Um, especially if you're going to come be an ally with us. We need to see where you are. So going to your, to your local First Nations people who, who have gardens, who still farm traditional, is a great way to learn about taking care of this earth. Um, when it comes to allies, when it comes to being allies for achieving our food sovereignty, I think the term allies is great, but I want you to be an accomplice with me. I want you to do what I'm doing. I want you to, to do it alongside of me or do it at your own home or learn from me or learn from another First Nations person to take care of the earth and to care and to take care of, to take care of your family as well by growing great crops. I want, I want to be able to say that I, I saw you put your hands in the soil. I saw you getting dirty. I saw the, the dirt on your brow because you're frustrated because your corn is taking too long to, to come out of the ground. I saw it. I want you to be that accomplice. I want you to be there. Because to me, I find that I think allies are great, but sometimes allies are only allies for a short period of time, and then they will walk away. If you're an accomplice, that means that you've actually done the work with me, and that you're you're in it for the long haul. So, when working with indigenous indigenous people when it comes to our food sovereignty and our gardens and taking care of the earth, I always say this one thing: listen to us. Just listen. We need you to listen to us. It's been it's been far too long where we have not been listened to. It's been far too long where we have been talked at. We want you to listen to us and talk with us because we have a lot of knowledge of, about this place that people are calling Canada or North America. It is with it is in us. It is in our blood DNA. We just want you to come talk to us. Come talk to us with open hands and open hearts and open minds. Because we all know that we, it's going to take all of us to make this world survive. It's going to take all of us to, to right the wrongs that have been done to this earth. Mm -hmm. So come listen. Because we've been listening to you for a long, long time. And when you start listening to us, you'll, you'll see where we're coming from. You can see how taking our ideas for indigenous food sovereignty and caring for the earth can go from your community to local to national to country. How mm -hmm. it all works together. Indigenous people are not here to ruin the earth. We're not here to destroy anything. We are here to make sure we take care and take care of our responsibilities that we have to maintaining this earth for the future generations. And not just for the future, future generations of indigenous people, future generations for people around the world. It's gonna take all of us, all of us, especially within this, this country called Canada to, to make this world go around and to, to, to present to our future generations a better earth. It's yeah. why we are here. It's what we're going to be doing for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Very well said and 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 comprehensive. I think you know. There's, um, yes, we need more than ever. We need accomplices. We need to abolish the systems that have been uh, established that are the root cause of this problem. Um, mm -hmm. The structures, the processes, the 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 ways of knowing the um the frameworks that you know they, they they're not working and mm -hmm. um and it's uncomfortable work showing up to to our to follow our leadership when you've never been conditioned to do that there's a lot of assumptions and biases that get made that can very much get in the way and we need help but we need it the way with that we need it not following somebody else's assumptions and biases and mm -hmm. so um with that i'm going to lead uh over to clifford and ask him to ask that answer that same question um around um oh where are the questions now um so how question. can indigenous systems yeah question four did you oh. do, would you need to repeat it or do you do you see it there um that was uh Hoping to answer question three, and it leads into the answer of question four. 
Oh, yes, both. Go ahead and answer them both. Okay, then. So, yeah, you can read off question three to me just to refresh my brain. Okay, okay. So, yeah, sorry, I, 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 um, I heard you speak a little bit to this in your last, uh, last answer, but yes, definitely expand on it. Um, so what does or what might Indigenous food sovereignty look like in your own community? And how does it help achieve social justice? recover traditional and local knowledge and move us towards ecological regeneration. Yes, perfect. Thank you for the uh, refreshing my brain. Uh, you know, I spoke earlier about the spiritual connection, Emsit Nogama, my sense of place, um, how I am governed by the uh, concept of medical limp and how that allows me to adhere to a form of a traditional law or Mi'kmaq natural law, which means for me to hunt, to fish and gather at certain times at certain places. You know, if I follow Nedigal Limp and Mi'kmaq natural law, that means I'm not hunting in May, June, July, that I'm actually harvesting something else at that time, which is the food is at its prime. So historically, you know, our people uh, they might match their migration patterns to the birds, the mammals, and the fish, and that we would uh, meet up with the food sources at the peak of their food value and at a time where we would not harm the populations of those animals and those, all these, the fish and insects, all these things that we harvest. So, um, you know, from... Uh, that perspective of building that relationship with the land and passing it on to our youth. When I see our First Nation communities offer food distribution of harvested uh, animals, harvested fish, medicines, uh, berries, you know, our, our community, if me and my brother were to get a moose and if anybody in our community is in need, our needs are not met until their needs are met. It is the ancient way, it's the way of the uh, ancient warrior to provide. The creator gave you the physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental capacities to carry on these things. And you are gifted that way. So you help out those who cannot make it out and those who do not have the means to get to the mountain and back and bring back a moose. So my brother tells me sometimes it's all right to show, to provide, and all you have to show for it is the blood on your boots. It's all right because other harvesters will take care of you. And that happened to us. We got three moose one year, gave it all away because the community needed it the most. And later in that season, some younger hunters said, hey, Clifford and Danny, you guys didn't get uh, any moose. You guys uh, gave away all your moose. You have to take these bundles. Your gifts from us to you so that you can have moose. <laughs> Mother Nature takes care of herself. Mother Nature is strong and beautiful. And so are our people. Mm -hmm. And that is how we survive. And that is the resilience of our nations. So when I see... And I'll have to show you a picture. I, I visit a camp and it's an old ladies camp and her great granddaughter, let me see if you can see that picture. Her great granddaughter is diving for clams. She is passing on the values of her family, passing on the values of her, what her grandmother used to do. And that's a five-year-old girl diving in the Bredore Wow. And coming up with clams, you know, when I see that, that tells me we are on the right path because I see our communities building uh, community gardens, food banks, and I would love to see those are great ideas. But let's um, let's make it stronger. Let's make it stronger than the food bank. Let's build cookhouses and have our traditional foods there and harvesters like myself, my brothers, others from other communities can bring in a moose, process it, cook it up, 
feed families, not for just a celebration or a special event, but just for the special occasion of feeding our families and contributing to that indigenous food sovereignty from a community level. And then I have to show another picture. This one is of my youngest granddaughter. Uh, she's three years old and she's leading the harvest of a <laughs> carrots in her family garden. She's barefoot. She is the wild child of our family. You know, when I see that and I know there's a supper coming around and I know they're going to have moose do with those carrots, the blending of uh, our traditional and contemporary for food values, for food, you know, that, that's incredible to me. That's incredible. And I, I think when, um, a family member shares the food, they're sharing the knowledge that goes with it. Because when we go out there, we say a prayer and it's a, I'll, I'll, I'll recite it because it's in my head, it's in my heart. So I offer tobacco and there's a lot of things that happen to us out there because we're spiritually connected. So things will happen and occur and will be wonderful. So we offer a prayer, we offer tobacco Everyone that's with us, indigenous or otherwise, I give them a pinch of tobacco and they, they make an offering and say a prayer. And one of the prayers I, I I say is I thank the creator that we're able to harvest here today. I thank the creator that we're here on this beautiful day that we have the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual means to carry on these teachings. I want to let the birds, the mammals, the fish, and the insects know. I'm saying this as I offer tobacco now and it's in my, it's in my spiritual realm i don't have to speak it i just say it in my spiritual way i want to let the birds mammals fish and insects know that we are here with good intention and love in our hearts i ask our ancestors to join in on us keep us safe allow us a safe and successful harvest should we not acquire food may we acquire knowledge which is ever conducive for our survival m signaluma all my relations and i offer to tobacco because our children are hungry for this type of teaching. And the landscapes and the seascapes are hungry for our children, are just as hungry for our children to go there and do these things that they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how I like to see it structured in our communities. And on a justice perspective, when we we behave in such a way that we honor our ancestors, the blood that was lost in, in the battles that led to these treaties of peace and friendship on the East Coast, and that we honor our we honor our ancestors by going back and doing the things that they have done in that story, which came to an abrupt end, now continues in our youth and now continues in in the way we harvest and now continues in the way we acquire knowledge and it's all the way we share this knowledge you know i can i can talk about uh traditional knowledge i can reference it in a library but i'm not doing my job my responsibility is to also live it breathe it taste it share it love it enjoy it and pass it on so for me that's how it has to be represented in the communities. Um, I can go on to the next question. Yeah, and I just want to check in on um, uh, timing. I know that, um, like, I don't think we have to be hard. At, like, I know three o'clock we were scheduled to go into. We've got questions piling up. So um, yep. once you're done. Um, I will I will look to some of these questions and leave ourselves some time for a discussion. So sure, I can answer that uh, next question in five minutes. Yeah, I'll and no, try my best. <laughs> no big rush, but it doesn't have to be right at three. I'm just being mindful of it. Yeah, no problem. We can talk all day. We can <laughs> do a whole day on this, but yeah, I'll give you the Reader's Digest of question number four. Can you uh, read it out to me again to refresh my brain? <laughs> yes. It's how can indigenous food systems and sovereignty contribute to transforming food systems more broadly? 
And how can others work as allies uh, to help achieve food sovereignty at personal, local, and wider level? Yeah, I think in uh, the community sense, like from the Mi'kmaq as a form of nationhood, we have different, uh, our, our territory is vast. And I've had elders, I've had indigenous food sovereignists come from Quebec and traded with me and my brother, they traded salmon for eels. <laughs> and we gladly done that. No money exchange whatsoever. My grandson provided a, a striped bass. No, it was a nice brown trout he caught, beautiful fish. And he gave it to an elder who requested it. And the elder, told him, uh, how much do I owe you? And my grandson, who is brought up the way we were supposed to be sharing, he, he looked him in the eyes and he told him, I don't need any money. <laughs> you know, he told him that. And uh, the elder uh, honored and praised uh, what he had done. Uh, so when we have it that our communities are able to network. One area, there may be more lobsters. Other areas, there may be no more eels. The only place you can hunt moose in, in Nova Scotia is in Unamagi. And we have uh, the movement of our people uh, from one area to the other, that we create a network and that we build. My dream is to build these um, these cookhouses on our communities to fight child poverty, to fight child poverty in our communities and to have our youth to go out there. You know, you tell a youth today, they're so distracted by communication. You tell a kid today, let's go uh, fishing. And they're like this with their, with their uh, games. Click, 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 click. And they get mad and they slam it when it doesn't go their way. They're wasting raw human emotion on on artificial means. And they say, oh, I'm artificial. Look, I caught a lunker. You know, we have we have to take them out and we have to get that, uh, separate that because the elders tell me our youth are divorced from nature and that they've lost that ability. The ability that's innate within them, that's in, born with them. They're not going out and practicing those things where they can express those gifts. So we build that network, we build the inclusion of our youth and that uh, they can provide and share within these, uh, within these uh, cookhouses. And we have in 2016, the province of Nova Scotia released some information on child poverty in the province. And where I'm from, Cape Breton, Unamagi, they said the child poverty rate there was deplorable and embarrassing, 35%. And that's all families, Mi'kmaq and non-Mi'kmaq. And that child poverty rates in the Mi'kmaq communities went from 35% to 76%. And I find it really, really difficult to process that information because if you look at our communities, they sit well within the territory and that we have the best access to resources, to wild foods and berries and medicines that can help us come combat uh, child poverty. We have the world-class hunting, fishing, and food gathering opportunities still in this fragmented landscape and in the fragmented communities, we still have access to this great food source, but it's not making it to the tables of our community members. Um, colonization, centralization, the introduction of welfare, uh, loss of access to the resource, that all contributed to that loss. Now we're getting it back. and. We're we coming about with our responsibilities. I don't know if you notice on partners, 
in partnerships with Moose, we have a working committee on Moose and that we are able to sit at a table with our provincial and federal counterparts because we have treaty rights and we have jurisdiction as an extension of those rights. I can sit at a table and I can tell them the Mi'kmaq say this, my harvesters tell me this, and through Mi'kmaq jurisdiction, we, we want to let you know that we are going to do this. And we work together. We don't try to uh, step on each other's toes, which historically they've been stomping on our feet. <laughs> and that's saying it nicely. Um, but we worked uh, arrangements and, uh, you know, the treaty, the Supreme Court says, you know, if the, if the moose are low, if there's conservation measures that have to be uh, met, depending on that level of conservation, non-Aboriginal interest in the resource will be stopped and Mi'kmaq harvesting will, uh, will continue. That's in everything in the treaties. And um, that relationship has to be understood that we are, that is part of our sovereignty, that is part of our ways and means of existence and that will always be that way. Just as the Buffalo are to the Plains Indians, so too are the Moose and the Salmon to the Mi'kmaq. And uh, I just wanna end it with the, with the allies. You know, we've been doing work with Parks Canada uh, long before reconciliation has been a buzzword by Parks Canada and other agencies. And uh, reconciliation is a term that's governmental and it still has that uh, paternalistic approach because reconciliation means, oh, I done something wrong and you done something wrong, let's reconcile. Really, it's the federal government and the churches and the schools, still in all those residential schools, they have to reconcile with us. So I don't know where they got that term reconciliation. My brother hates it. But anyways, long before reconciliation was a, a buzzword, we were doing great work with Parks Canada. And Parks Canada in Cape Breton had a problem with a moose, a hyperabundant population of moose. Our harvesters knows, noticed it a long time ago. They say, we're going on these trails and we're tripping over moose droppings. There's lots of damage to the trees. And they told, I remember our community uh, representatives telling Parks Canada people, you have a overpopulation of moose. And if there was ever a problem, let the Mi'kmaq be part of the solution. I remember them telling them that because I was on a committee when I was a college student and we were sitting with Parks Canada. That was before I even got into this role. And I still remember to the day, the, the people that told them that, but Parks Canada took a while to understand. Now it got to a point where that overpopulation was doing damage to the ecosystem and that um, they asked us to be part of the solution. So I'm the one who organized what everybody in Canada knows as a cult in the national park on moose. But uh, we called it a traditional harvest. We never called it a call because, you know, we're, we're doing traditional things in the modern way. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you, in four years, we took out 138 moose in a 20 square kilometer section of the park. Mm -hmm. That's 63,480 pounds of meat. 31.7 tons. That translates to 190,440 meals. And if you put a dollar value, uh, you can't put a dollar value on the importance of this food security, that feeling that your family is sitting at a table, rich, moderate, or well below, <laughs> well below those standards. When you have moose on the table and your family's eating this great meal, you can't put a dollar value on it because it's a delicacy. Well, I'm going to give a moderate figure of $11.03 a pound. That is $700,000 worth of food given to our communities by our harvesters. And the greatest thing about that story is it was given to food banks. It was given to uh, Department of Justice where prisoners can have a powwow and eat this meat, which they don't get in the prison system. It was given to locals like who live in the area, non-Mi'kmaq people. 
non Mi'kmaq food banks and other food banks of feed Nova Scotia and community distribution in our communities. That $700,000 worth of food, not counting the hides, the hooves, the antlers, tongues and bones, whatever our communities members needed for things they do to make drums and all that stuff and to make certain uh, tools. That was the biggest contribution against child poverty and our harvesters had done it anonymously because to do this harvest, they have to harvest anonym anonymously and they can't put their names on any social media till after it was done. We did that in four years. So the greatest contribution against child poverty in the province of Nova Scotia was done anonymously by our harvesters. And guess what? This is probably the first time anybody in this, in this webinar heard of it because the media would rather say, Clifford Paul is organizing a cult in a national park and he's not including non-Aboriginal people to assist. That's controversial. Let's write the articles on controversy. So when the, after it was all over, the media trying to get a hold of me, I, CBC called me up, said, well, we want your opinion. We want this, we want that. I say, hey, let's talk about the social strengths of what we had done. Yeah. Let's throw the controversy away. Let's talk about the social impact of what this yeah. had done for our communities. And yeah. that's where the story went from there. And I have to share that. Every time we talk about Indigenous food sovereignty, I have to share that. Yeah. So Parks Canada is just one of our partners. We need more. That's amazing. And that's really a huge contribution to um, Indigenous food systems of which we as Indigenous peoples are very much a part of. And yeah, there's, um, uh, you know, the, the healthy food, providing healthy food to our communities is definitely integrated with the conservation of the species themselves, such as moose and wild salmon. And, and it's through our harvesting that keeps them coming back to us and, and keeps the biodiversity on which they rely upon um, healthy and vibrant. So really important work you guys are doing. Um, it's a great example. And I'm, I'm really grateful to hear about that. And um, I'm just looking at the time and I we do have questions that um, Mark is going to share with us from the audience. But before we do that, I'm just going to take two or three minutes um, to answer that last question um, around Indigenous food systems and, and sovereignty contributing to the transformation of uh, food systems more broadly. I think um, it's actually essential that food systems uh, in general transform. Um, we know that the agriculture is one of the um, biggest drivers of climate change. We know that um, agriculture, um, since it was uh, first introduced into humanity about 12,000 years ago when they first started domesticating plants and animals, that that correlates with the time period where the health of humans and ecosystems have, have also declined. Um, so I think indigenous hunters and fishers and gatherers have play a huge role, a significant role in shifting the paradigm beyond that just an like agriculture centric narrative, the way that it's led to the building of a colonial empire and a corporate empire that is gotten way out of control uh, and has way too much control. And I think as indigenous uh, peoples on the front lines, our knowledge, our language, our culture, all the things you've been sharing, our values, our wisdom um, is integrated to the, the conservation of the complex system of indigenous biodiversity and cultural heritage that everybody benefits from. Um, we need a healthy planet. We need clean drinking water. We need our forests intact to mitigate climate change. Climate change is happening at a very, very unprecedented rate. And I don't think, like there, I see one of the questions is with regards to can, uh, the COVID and pandemic planning, but I just wanna also, um, where we are living in multiple overlapping crises of COVID-19, climate change, global food insecurity, 
um, coloniality and capitalism. And I think until um, we recognize the significant role that indigenous food sovereignty and our knowledge through the living reality of it and keeping it alive, until that's validated as a valid way of knowing and science, um, right now the Western science-based techno-bureaucratic system for research and quote unquote development has made us invisible. There is no framework to reconcile um, because that framework was designed to dispossess us. I heard Justice Marie Sinclair say when the Truth and Reconciliation Report was released that we can't reconcile in the same framework. So we need to transition, a just transition out of a reductionist mindset that has limited um, the way that uh, land and water and people and plants and animals, the way that we relate to them um, needs to be, um, we need to reconnect that and move beyond the fragmented system of silos and sectors that is really inadequate. It's not able to deal with the complexity that we need to be able to work in to, to live through these multiple crises. Mm -hmm. So, um, and in terms of allies um, showing up to that, I think it's really looking at, at yourselves um, and, and all of us looking at ourselves in that work and taking responsibility for ourselves because it's, it's easy when, when the work gets hard um, to really kind of decolonize our minds and our conditioning and the way the system has mechanized the spirit and the soul out of our, out of our land and food system and create, created machines and producers um, you know, I think that that's hard work to, to realize that in ourselves and then to, to show up in a way where we are listening and we're learning to do things differently. And, um, and a lot of that work, you know, as leader um, in the food sovereignty movement, of course, it's important leaders have compassion and care and give of themselves and to be of service um, to the greater whole and the way Clifford was talking and Isaac um, was talking about around giving, sharing and trading and living and demonstrating what that looks like as a leader. And individuals need to take responsibility for themselves. As leaders, we cannot take responsibility for everybody. Everybody has, we're, we're these existential crises in which we're living in um, is really, challenging us to be better humans and to, we can only do that for ourselves. Um, and in my language, we say, um, which means take care of yourself first, and then and then you can give to the, the collective whole. If you can't feed yourself, um, then somebody else would have to do that for you. And so we, we need to be able to contribute to the collective health and well-being of the whole. And it's not about being selfish. It's about really showing up in a way where we're doing our own work. So I'll leave it at that. And um, thank you uh, for your amazing, rich contributions and discussion to the discussion questions. It was um, really uh amazing and beautiful and I was really honored to be a part of this space with you and and to to learn about your work so thank you thank you so much uh thanks to all of you I mean there's always like it's almost like a magic that happens <laughs> when you bring people together from different places and you throw out these questions and you just let it emerge and it, it's really a beautiful thing so I I, I we, we do have some questions from the audience and probably more than we can possibly handle. So what I thought I would do is I would just let you know what those questions are and then let each of you choose to answer one of them uh, in the time, whichever one that, you know, enthuses you the most or which you, you think that you could contribute the most to. So uh, some of the questions asked, uh, Gary Kinney was asking about examples of two-eyed scene and how that might have influence settler farmers and gardeners to incorporate indigenous foodways into their food practices. Uh, 
Martha Steekman was asking, I think, particularly to Clifford about uh, jurisdictional space with the Canadian and Nova Scotian governments recognizing Micmac uh, around moose management, which, you, you know, you might have already spoken to that a bit, but, you know, that would be another possible uh, question. Uh, Larry McDermott, McDermott was asking this one about the COVID pandemic and take the importance of what have we learned from that in terms of taking care of food and that needs in community. And then a final one that, you know, which is a pretty open one would be uh, success stories uh, where Indigenous peoples have been able to take back land, water access for harvesting uh, or other stories or practices that evidence some kind of hopeful change of movement toward Indigenous food sovereignty. So as I say, those are a lot of questions. I know we can't possibly <laughs> answer them in the time that's left, but uh, maybe we could just kind of do a round, and I'm just going to be a little bit arbitrary here. Maybe we go like Isaac, Don, and Clifford, and maybe you each take, you know, three or four minutes to answer your favorite question of, of those that have been asked. Okay. Uh, do you want me to start? Sure, go ahead. All right. So there's actually two that really got my attention, but I'll just do the one about the... From Gary Kenny, I well, appreciate some examples of um, where two eyed seeing was influenced settlers, farmers, gardeners, and corporate indigenous foodways. So, in my programs at Evergreen Brickworks, my volunteers, not all my volunteers are indigenous. I have not a lot of non indigenous volunteers. So, what I've been doing was introducing and talked earlier about clay pot irrigation and how because our climate is changing, the weather is hotter in the summertime. You don't, you can't water as much because you water too much. Whereas you water coming from it just destroyed the water table. So clay pot irrigation is a way that First Nations people, Indigenous people across North America, have been using terracotta or clay pots in the soil, filled with water, covered to 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 water their plants. So I've been teaching that at Brickworks since I've been. I've learned that from my grandfather. He learned it from his grandfather's. Um, so one year, one of the volunteers, she saw me doing this. I had her do it in the gardens there. And she was so impressed by it that she went back to her father's farm. Her father was having a problem with his watering and stuff like that. They incorporated this idea to their farm and their, their produce that year was an absolute success. She was, she was so shocked by it. I said, don't be shocked by it. Just trust what we know. Trust that we know how to take care of this world, this earth, that we know how to take care of these gardens. And so with that, she's, she's been telling everyone about that. I've had other volunteers take that same idea and do other things with it. And looking at, three, at the Three Sisters Gardening, how, how non-Indigenous people are taking Three Sisters Gardening to their backyards, to their home, to their own homes, and learning about it and learning how to rejuvenate their soil through this as well. So there's a lot of practices that have come out from my teachings at Brickworks that people who are non-Indigenous actually take home and actually utilize and come back the next year and tell me that it worked and it worked successfully for them, which makes me makes me happy because I want the Indigenous youth to learn about it, but I also need non-Indigenous people to learn about this as well. Because like I said before, it's going to take all of us to conquer this. Okay, I'm done with the answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Isaac. And, uh, and Don, do you have a favorite question? Yes, I do, but it's not one you mentioned. I see another one in the question, the Q and A from okay, the one that just got added, or another one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, from Fiona McNeil Knowles. Mm -hmm. uh, he says that this question is directed towards Don, and it is the question is: Do you think it is possible for small-scale farming movement in Canada, quote unquote, to support and be accomplices in Indigenous food sovereignty, or do you need to dissenter uh, settler agriculture story altogether. So excellent question. And um, ex I'm excited to answer that because I've been doing a lot of thinking about that lately. And um, and I think definitely there's a role for small scale uh, farming movement um, to support and be accomplices to indigenous food sovereignty. And I do think we need to decenter uh, the settler agriculture story um, and it's probably just a matter of timeline and what that looks like in a just transition. Um, I think that it's great that the uh, small scale farming movement, uh, regenerative agriculture, organic gardening, um, I think that, that it's great that um, in the sense that that model of agriculture is minimizing the ecological impact on indigenous land on which 
it all is based uh, upon, when you recognize the sovereignty of indigenous peoples, um, the land is still indigenous. It's been unseated, even in places where treaties have been signed. It was my understanding they were, the land was not surrendered um, and the, the unique relationships of indigenous peoples to land was never surrendered. It was more peacekeeping measures. Um, uh, I think was the original intention of some of the older treaties. So it really goes to the, back to the land um, to think about um, minimizing the ecological impact that agriculture, which is really a settler colonial narrative. I know indigenous peoples, especially back East grew corn traditionally and there were traditional forms of agriculture. But I think if you were to uh, learn about that in their languages, you would find that it was framed in different stories and language and terminology. So I think, yes, to be accomplices to indigenous peoples who are remembering those stories and remembering the way the ways that we would frame um, the work to uh, decenter the story of agriculture and kind of, to me, that's as much a, um, a, a social, economic and a political um, necessity, um, because the Indigenous peoples, we will never achieve food sovereignty without our land base. And sadly, the existing story of um, resource based uh, management systems that are asserted across such an imperialistic scale of, of so called Canada. Um, is it's, it's a direction to a lot of the values we've talked about today. It's, it's, a, it's a resource based system, which is extractive. The problem is, is resource extraction is the exact opposite of giving. So as we're giving and sharing, it's being extracted and taken. And there's a huge global economy. And if you look on the Ministry of Agriculture website, Department of Fisheries and Oceans website, you'll see their mandate is for global export for trade. That's not food sovereignty. That, that's the system that is the problem. So I think we do need to decenter that, but that's about capitalism. That's about um, coloniality. And there's trying to uh, dismantle those structures and processes that have been so harmful and are still continuing to perpetuate um, and institute our poverty and our food security, food insecurity, um, let alone the climate crisis and the COVID, the public health, you know, the sickness, sickness is the system. I know there's a book written about a, mm -hmm. a title of that by a well-known economist in the US, but um, yeah, I think transitioning out of a production paradigm to a more regenerative, life-giving, holistic health paradigm and uh, transitioning out of a resource-based uh, kind of neoclassic economic framework. Small-scale farming, if we all grew enough food to feed ourselves, we wouldn't need to rely on grocery stores and capitalism. And I think that's what Isaac and Clifford and many, many, there's a beautiful movement. Um, these ideas are much bigger than any one of us. This is a big movement that's um, a lot of knowledge being mobilized and generated around it. So I hope that answers uh, Fiona's questions, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. I, I hear that, that movement like from e extractivism and commodification to one of regeneration and gift economy really, which is just, I think that, that's such an uh, incredible, important and deep insight. Um, so Clifford, your, your, what was your favorite question? Which one did you decide to, that you want to take on? My other panelists took the, took the berries right off the tree there. <laughs> but I, I do have a question that relates to me anyways. It's the one about uh, success stories where we gain back uh, land and water access for harvesting in public or private property. Um, I can answer that. Uh, you know, the Mi'kmaq have peace and friendship treaties. We never walked around with paper in our pocket, willing, ready and willing to sign treaties. We lived our lives. We fought and resisted the British so well that they asked us to sign a treaty of peace and friendship. 
they asked us to enter into a relationship with them, which allows them to co-live on our lands and we can do our things, they can do their thing. And we, we told them, yes, we will do that. And over time, they forgot. <laughs> over time, they took advantage of this relationship and just took, took large tracts of land, you know, closed off our hunting and fishing areas and built their communities. And our communities suffered greatly. And then I guess the greatest thing that happened with us is our, we never forgot the treaties. The British Crown wrote down their interpretation of the treaties and our leaders, our chiefs, who had no sense of that written word back in the 1700s, told the interpretation orally. And in 1928, the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq Nation was um, trapping muskrats. And he did so two weeks after the provincial regulations. And they charged him. And he was telling them, no, I, I harvest uh, muskrats at this time of the year because their food value is prime and their fur value is prime. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting a uh, good good a good score for my for doing what I'm doing. So he, he reminded the Canada, the province of Nova Scotia, he reminded them that we have treaties of peace and friendship and we have articles that we can hunt and fish as usual without being hindered in that. So he went to court and the judge told him, your your treaties are not worth the paper it's written on. And he got charged for that. And he had those charges all through his life. So in 1928, uh, we put the treaty. The treaty was put up, and the, the courts at that time said, it, "Your treaties are not worth the paper it was written on." Imagine that pre-Confederation treaties signed from nation to nation. So in 1977, we had a, a Mi'kmaq person in one of our communities shoot a deer on the reserve. Nova Scotia Department of Lands and Forests took him to court and said, you're not allowed to hunt deer on your reserve. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to hunt deer anywhere in Nova Scotia. You need license and all this stuff. And uh, he went to court and he went to the Supreme Court of Canada and he won. It was the Isaac decision, 1977. And then we had another incident. I'm, I'm really speaking the success story is that the litigation period of our people reminding Canada that these treaties are very important. And in 1985, we had a, a man from one of our communities, uh, Sibin Agadi. He went out to a, a, a pit off the reserve to, and he was uh, doing, sighting in his rifles, or he was testing out his uh, shotgun, I believe he was testing it out. And then on his way back, he got stopped by Lands and Forest, and Lands and Forest says, oh, you're hunting, are you? He says, no, I'm just sighting in my rifles. Well, you're in an area where people hunt and you have a rifle, we're gonna to have to charge you. So he took the, they took the Supreme Court of Canada and proved that our rights are valid, existing and still in force, signed between nations before the reserves were even created. And uh, that was a major uh, decision in 1985. So we took it to Moose. 1988, we organized a hunt. It was met with incredible resistance. I remember I was a journalist at that time. I was taking pictures that were going across, across the, on the CP wire. and uh, They took our harvesters to court and we won that. And it was interesting in 19, at that time, the, I was a journalist. I was covering the, uh, the trial in Bedak and the province sent uh, a professor from uh, UNB to go to Britain and study all the treaties, the written interpretation of the treaties. And he came back with information that said, oh, the Mi'kmaq treaties are null and void because they got into bar fights in Halifax, <laughs> hostilities. And he tried to say these things. And yet our historians who, who learned all the interpretation of the oral interpretation of these treaties, 
they kicked their butts so bad in court that the province packed up their gear and left and a decision was in our favor. So, so two with the fisheries, you know, Donald Marshall one, Donald Marshall two and other cases. So I would say that for me to get back out there and feel invited by the creator to do so is that Supreme Court of Canada decisions where they told the province, they told the federal government, stop taking the Mi'kmaq to court, work with them, work with them. You're using up a lot of their resources, you're using up a lot of our res their, your resources, and you're using up a lot of the Supreme Court of Canada time. You know they have these victories, you know they have these Supreme Court decisions, work with them. So it's wonderful now I can sit at a table and talk about Mi'kmaq jurisdiction because of those victories. To me, that is the success story for us. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleague Victoria to come on to close with the final thank yous, but I also want to say thank you. And before I hand it off to her, to, but it's been wonderful listening to all of you. And thanks once again for sharing your, your wisdom with us and your stories been very moving and we've learned a lot. So I'll hand it off on to Victoria. Yes, as Mark said, uh, thank you, Isaac, Don and Clifford uh, for taking the time to share your knowledge and wisdom with us today. Um, thank you, Don, for her, not only your patience and wisdom, uh, but for leading us in discussion. We really appreciate it. And I hope that these words move us to continue to explore concrete pathways towards right relationships, decolonization, and re-indigenization, um, and especially those of us in a place of privilege and power, we have to ask ourselves, how can we concretely become respectful, supportive allies, and remembering that the term allyship is a verb. So as Isaac mentioned, uh, let us become accomplices um, and act together. Um, in that uh, note, uh, for several years, the forum has been committed to an ongoing transformation of what we claimed to know, um, which has been a process marked by both learning and unlearning. And as a result, we have been working with an advisory group and an editorial team that's made up of both indigenous and non-indigenous members to produce a new resource titled Listening to Indigenous Voices, a dialogue guide on justice and right relationships. Oops, sorry, uh, my screen just went. Um, we saw it as our responsibility as both settlers and newcomers living on this land, as people who have benefited from the legacy of colonialism and the land taken from indigenous people um, to take action and do what we can to help live up to our responsibility as treaty peoples and address the legacy of injustice. Um, so we have worked to create a guide that seeks to stimulate dialogue and action in favor of justice and decolonization on this part of Turtle Island the guide begins by exploring indigenous worldviews, goes on to examine uh, the history of colonization and concludes with sessions on right relationships, decolonization and indigenization. Um, it includes writings from authors such as Arthur Manuel, Beverly Jacobs, John Burroughs, Lee Miracle, um, and along with works from a variety of indigenous artists, uh, including Kent Monkman and Christy Belcourt. In listening to indig indigenous voices, seeks to both build on and go beyond the Cairo's blanket exercise uh, and includes questions to guide sharing circles as well as curriculum ideas for use in secondary and post-secondary educational settings. Uh, we'll also be pro uh, providing supplementary online materials uh, which will also be available including videos, articles, spiritual reflections and suggested readings. So if you're interested in either promoting this resource or using this resource yourself, or if you just wanna learn uh, more about it, we encourage you to go to ltiv.ca um, and you can uh, fill out a pre-order form if you're interested. We'll also be hosting uh, virtual launch events uh, April 28th in English, uh, and I believe May 4th in French, but correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. Um, and if you would like to sign up, please send us an email, um, sign up as part of our mailing list, or if you follow us on social media, we'll be keeping you updated that way. Uh, thank you. And again, thank you, Isaac, John, and Clifford. It's been um, a great evening. 
I'm so honored to uh, be able to learn from all three of you. And I hope that um, the Jesuit Forum and myself can continue to uh, work to bring, together to bring about uh, indigenous uh, sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you, Kukstam. Hukwadi Kusaltin in my language. That's all my relations. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.